Thanks, Doug, and good afternoon and good morning to all. It is truly my pleasure to welcome you to CAFC's FASD webinar series. And this, this is our inaugural webinar uh, in a series that will run between March and June um, of this year. Um, we've had tremendous interest and registration uh, in, in this series, and, and we're certainly delighted to welcome you all. In partnership with, uh, with many fetal alcohol spectrum disorder experts, researchers, and organizations, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers has facilitated the development of a national screening toolkit for children and youth identified and potentially affected by FASD. The upcoming webinar series that, that I've just described for you will introduce participants um, many colleagues from across the country and, and beyond Canada's borders to the components of the toolkit as well as engage you in an interactive dialogue with content experts from across Canada. Our first webinar, um, which is going to be led by Dr. Sterling Claren and um, Dr. Christine Locke, um, is going to focus on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder an in-depth overview, and a national dialogue with our experts. We're going to really present FASD from 10,000 feet, if you will, and then as our series progresses over the next several months, we're going to drill down into the different components of the toolkit, how it was developed, etc. I thought for those of you who are uh, new to, to CAFC, I would just take a moment to share our organization with you and provide a little bit of background information. The Canadian Association of Pediatric Hospitals was co-founded in 1968 by the leaders then of the children's hospitals across Canada. Today, however, CAFC's scope ranges across the continuum of care, and we are very proud to support 45 member organizations from coast to coast representing multidisciplinary health professionals that provide health care services to children, youth, and their families within our acute care hospitals, community hospitals, rehabilitation centers, as well as home care provider agencies. Again, that crossing the continuum of care, which is extremely important to the population that we serve. All children's hospitals in Canada are members of CAFC thereby providing some tremendous linkage to clinical care, education, and research. Health promotion and health care delivery, as I'm sure everyone online recognizes, are truly complex issues, especially for more vulnerable infant, child, and youth populations. CAFC is very committed to improving and promoting health service delivery for our children and youth across the continuum of care, as well as to enhancing the application of knowledge from research to practice and practice to health policy. And that really is a lot of what our webinar series uh, is, is all about. I just wanted to, uh, to point out CAFC's mission um, which is to support our member and partner organizations through education, research, and quality improvement initiatives that ultimately improve health outcomes and health service delivery for our children and youth. I've, I've highlighted um, one very important way in which we do this, and that's by identifying and responding to emerging issues and trends that impact the communities that we serve. And this really does speak to the work um, in the development of our FASD screening toolkit. Our five strategic priorities are establishing programs and activities that address current and emerging child and youth health care priorities, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder certainly being one of them, advocating for transforming health service delivery for children and youth across our country, connecting service providers and key stakeholders to realize shared child and youth health care goals, and these webinars bringing so many people together from across the country is one way that we address that, that goal of, of, of connectivity, 
fostering research, brokering knowledge, facilitating educational opportunities, and enhancing information exchange is another very key activity and something that really crosses everything that we do, as well as building capacity and enhancing the strength, the health of our organization to ensure that we can continue to meet and achieve our various goals and objectives. As I mentioned, that uh, very top strategic priority <coughs> to address emerging and current priorities and healthcare issues, our work focused on developing our national screening toolkit for children and youth identified and potentially affected by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder has been a true uh, labor of love for CAFC uh, for almost four years now and has engaged um, many, many, first of all, has engaged a national steering committee and I'm sure many of you will recognize all of the names on the slide before you. Um, Dr. Gideon Corrin, Dr. Ted Rosales, Ab Chutley from Winnipeg, Dr. Stuart McLeod, Christine and Sterling uh, will be presenting to you in, in literally just a moment, as well as our administrative staff who have, who have been uh, integral in, in managing the project uh, over the last several years. I also want to point out, as highlighted in red on this slide, is there has been a tremendous collaborative uh, effort that has really engaged uh, hundreds of individuals from across the country, from the research, clinical, as well as um, administrative communities at uh, many of our uh, workshops. Uh, I want to acknowledge our partnership in this work with the Public Health Agency of Canada, as well as the First Nations Inuit Health Branch of Health Canada and our colleagues that are listed for you on this slide. And then finally, just to share with everyone, and all this information is available on the CAFC website, our Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, and, the, and as Doug mentioned, these slides will be available to everyone post uh, today's webinar. But our series, which is being launched today, um, we'll continue uh, with six webinars between now and June of uh, 2011. And the second slide just shows you the balance. The purpose of our webinars is really all about dissemination and knowledge, uh, knowledge translation, sharing information, introducing you to the screening toolkit, wanting to mention to everyone that the, uh, the tools within um, the kit are in fact currently being piloted in different areas across Canada and, uh, and the results of those pilot studies will be made available to everyone. Um, our pilot work will continue, uh, it began in 2010 and will conclude in March of 2012. Um, and we will continually update you on the information, on new information as it becomes available. And that you can currently um, access the uh, screening toolkit by visiting the Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, and the URL is posted uh, here for you and there will be lots more um, sort of information uh, shared with you throughout today that, that will guide you to the uh, online version of our knowledge uh, of our screening toolkit. And then finally there's a bit more contact information here that will be made available to you post today's webinar. And without any further ado, um, at this point in time it is my, uh, my pleasure and we'll just uh, make sure that everyone can see this slide. Hello. There we Hello. Go. All righty. So at this point in time, um, I, it is my pleasure to turn the, the microphone and the webinar over to our two presenters, uh, Dr. Sterling Claren, uh, who is a clinical professor of pediatrics at the University of British Columbia, Faculty of Medicine, 
Sterling is also the CEO of the Canada Northwest Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Research Network, and it is also my pleasure to introduce his co-presenter, Dr. Christine Locke. Christine is a developmental pediatrician at BC Children's Hospital, as well as an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of British Columbia. Christine and, Claire, and, and uh, Sterling, thank you for presenting uh, this afternoon for your leadership, and I now turn our, our virtual uh, microphone over to you. Chris, it's a pleasure. It, well, it's a pleasure. It's Chris Slock uh, in Vancouver, and I'm uh, joined by my colleague and uh, mentor uh, in a journey that for me has uh, now uh, uh, over over two decades in working in the area of uh, fetal alcohol syndrome and fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, and uh, Dr. Claren, who is one of the original investigators uh, uh, from the time of its first uh, report in the English uh, language in the 1970s. Uh, Sterling and I plan to do sort of a back and forth. Uh, and Sterling, let's let them hear your voice, and, and then we'll move forward with uh, what our objectives uh, are. Uh, we have nothing to disclose, uh, and we are providing this to you all uh, with the intent that we use this for educational purposes, and uh, we would expect that you would uh, give uh, recognition to the authors uh, uh, and to the, or the original researchers uh, wherever appropriate. So, Sterling, um, uh, how about a hello from, uh, uh, from your end? We're in different cities today. Well, hi folks, uh, this is Sterling Claren, and uh, well, like Chris, I'm delighted to be with you today and talk about this. this is a little bit of an experiment for us, too. We're going to try to share the slides and go back and forth without stepping on each other's voices, so um, bear with us. Thank you. So, um, my, my role uh, as an associate professor has uh, been to focus on teaching and learning, and uh, I can't start uh, a presentation without uh, first knowing where we're going, what are our objectives. And uh, these objectives are the same objectives that we presented to the Federal Minister of Health in the early 1990s, uh, the basic uh, uh, what, who, what, where, when, how uh, of FAS and now FASD. So over the course of this webinar, we'll be addressing uh, the definition of what is FASD, who is at risk. So we'll also be addressing things such as those timing of exposure to alcohol and other factors that may place a, a woman and uh, her her child at risk. Uh, we'll be covering the uh, approach to diagnosis in Canada, our national guidelines. Uh, We'll be addressing incidence of prevalence, or how common uh, is a condition of FAS and of FASD, of the spectrum of disorders. We'll be discussing how we screen for FASD, but as Elaine has said, uh, there will be a subsequent webinar which goes into detail the toolkit that has been developed to, with the support from uh, Health Canada and CAPC. Uh, Sterling and I have just come from uh, a five-day international meeting on FASD here in Vancouver, and we hope to have some time to give you some insights uh, woven into our presentation and at the end to talk about some of the new findings uh, from both uh, basic science and clinical research around FASD, and uh, then some reflection about how we should approach or reapproach uh, our efforts uh, for prevention, getting the message out uh, and, uh, and what are the advances with respect to uh, interventions and treatment. So uh, I think that it's helpful for all of you to know that FAS wasn't uh, discovered in 1973 in Seattle, but it was rediscovered uh, and it was given a name. Uh, going back, uh, there have been references to alcohol use uh, in, uh, in pregnancy to biblical times, including in the Song of Samson. There were references in the Greek and Roman uh, history, uh, and the best written records, records are actually some very, uh, very strong research around the role of uh, alcohol uh, of, and uh, its impact on offspring, uh, especially for women who were uh, 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 incarcerated, uh, and, and then the picture that you see here actually of uh, 
uh, William Hogarth's uh, uh, lithograph of uh, Jim Lane, and it was Dr. Claren who told me that this may be our first uh, clinical lithograph of uh, of a child uh, who has the facial features of uh, of FAS, and as you can see, he's falling from his mother's arms uh, into the streets of Jim Lane, and you could we can appreciate what was happening at that time and why uh, Hogarth was actually um, uh, uh, contracted to do these prevention posters about the uh, the the evils of uh, of Jim. Uh, of course, at that time they thought that beer was uh, uh, was healthy, and there's quite a different poster for what it looked like uh, on 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 Beer Alley as such. Uh, to move on, uh, though, actually uh, it was Dr. Lavoine in France who. Uh, put together an elegant case report of, of multiple cases in France in the 1960s, uh, but it was the discovery at, uh, at uh, the inner city uh, hospital intrauterine growth retardation clinic uh, uh, by, uh, by a young resident uh, and, then, uh, uh, and then further investigated by uh, Dr. Smith uh, with Dr. Jones, uh, Dr. Claren and others uh, that came the first report in the Lancet in the 1970s, 1973. We have British Columbia on the map uh, starting in the mid-70s uh, with the pioneering work of, uh, of Kojo Asante in the north, uh, in the Yukon territories and in northern British Columbia, and uh, he contacted uh, uh, his, his colleagues and his teachers at the, uh, UBC, and in particular Dr. Jeffrey Robinson, and the first study was published about the observations of, uh, of uh, and first reports of fetal alcohol syndrome in Canada. Uh, we've gone on uh, uh, since the, the 70s uh, uh, to engage uh, with uh, the rest of Canada and Health Canada's uh, uh, and, and our politicians, including uh, a standing uh, members committee uh, in, uh, in Parliament in the 1990s. That began our journey, and uh, and it is it was uh, uh, it was certainly a, a change to see uh, a, an audience uh, with over a thousand people at an international conference uh, this last week uh, from those early days uh, when uh, when this was uh, in the hands of a few professionals. Uh, during these past uh, 20 years, so. Uh, FAS has uh, gone uh, live uh, as such across the world with, with a uh, high instance of uh, FAS uh, seen uh, in, uh, in, in many countries, including Russia, Romania, South Africa, with active studies there. And we had over 20 countries represented at the international conference uh, this past week. So uh, FASD is an umbrella term. Uh, it is not a diagnostic term, but it in it uh, takes under its uh, umbrella the full fetal alcohol syndrome, which Dr. Claren will go into detail, but the triad of uh, an effect on growth, facial features of the brain in the context of prenatal alcohol exposure. A term partial FAS is used when essentially only two of those three features uh, may be seen, and a term alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder, the more invisible disability when you are uh, working with an individual who is presenting with uh, features of brain injury uh, in the context of prenatal alcohol exposure, but uh, not showing any of the physical uh, uh, growth or facial features. Uh, and so these are the terms that are encompassed in our national guidelines, uh, and the only one that I haven't mentioned is the term alcohol-related birth defects. Uh, it has been used and misused uh, over over uh, time, uh, but it actually reflects uh, uh, specific birth defects which, which may also arise uh, uh, if at a critical time in organ development, uh, so conditions like a neural tube defect, spina bifida, or uh, a craniofacial clefting, cleft lip, cleft palate, uh, are, are some common examples of alcohol-related birth defects. It may occur in addition to uh, uh, features of the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Uh, Dr. Claren uh, uh, is going to take you through more of uh, the, the elements uh, in uh, describing the, the syndrome uh, and uh, the spectrum of effects. Uh, thanks, Chris. The um, first question that one might always ask when dealing with a teratogen is why is there a specific syndrome at all? Um, as we will talk about in a few minutes, Teratogens, by their very nature, are determined by frequency and dose and timing and many other features, ought to give a wide range of abnormalities rather than a discrete syndrome. That's the situation for most drugs. And indeed, if that were 
exclusively true for fetal alcohol. If it was all fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, we may still not know about this particular serious environmental cause of birth defects. But fortunately, there was a lucky break. And at least for a few folks, there is a specific condition still called fetal alcohol syndrome. And as you compare that disorder on the slide, Chris, go back, uh, to the whole range of the spectrum, you can see that the list of things that are part of the spectrum is uh oh, what happened now? Is the same as fetal alcohol syndrome except except for the face. Not a very important problem. People with FAS are rather cute. But that's really the only piece of the spectrum that separates um, that's discrete disorder from, from the group as a whole. Next slide. Growth deficiency was a, a herald feature of this disorder at its inception, but you'll remember that Chris told you that Dr. Smith uh, worked this syndrome out in a growth deficiency clinic. Over time, growth has not been found to be such an easy thing to understand in kids with FAS or FASD. These are the original 11 children described by Smith for height. And you can see that at birth, most of them were quite short. And all of them were below one standard deviation. But over time, they grew in very different ways. And more than half of them wound up above minus two standard deviations by the time they were adults. Growth deficiency in, in a an environmental agent like alcohol is really a muting, a blunting of full growth potential. And since we don't really often have enough information on family history to really be crisp in our prediction of how tall someone should ultimately be, uh, defining growth deficiency as present in an individual case of FAS has been challenging. And next slide. Next slide. As I said, the face of FAS is the piece that uh, separates FAS from the rest and is the most distinctive part of the disorder. Now, I will tell you that these kids all have the face of FAS. How do I know that? Because I diagnose them all. At the end of the day, facial recognition still is mediated through the human brain in a nonverbal pattern recognition manner. And while trained clinicians will all tell you that these kids all look the same, you all know they don't completely look the same. You can tell who's a boy and who's a girl, that they have different racial backgrounds, that they're slightly different ages, and so on. They don't have similar ears. They don't have similar foreheads, if you can see their foreheads. So how do we say they're all the same? That actually took a great deal of work. Next slide. Um, the, the work actually started with things like this. Uh, this is a doll that was uh, put on the market. A grandmother found it and thought it looked like her granddaughter with fetal alcohol and bought it for her daughter to give to her grandchild. Uh, push the button, please. The doll was named Pitiful Pearl. I believe it's been taken off the market now. But the point was, if an artist could make a face with FAS from, with a doll, there must be a way to analyze this face and figure out what exactly makes the face look like it looks. Next slide. This was ultimately done with a computerized system. We, uh, Susan Astley and I took photo photographs of children that experts said had fetal alcohol syndrome. We passed all the photographs around to a group of other dysmorphologists, got a data set that everybody agreed was the face and sent it into the computer and said, what exactly are the features that make these kids look alike to experts? It turned out after analyzing about 70 different findings that three were key. The size of the eye slit opening, the palpebral fissure, and the shape of the upper lip, and the, the little widget between your nose and your lip called the filtrum. As the filtrum gets longer, flatter, smoother, and the lip thinner, coupled with small palpebral fissure openings, that turns out to be the features that doctors are recognizing. Next slide. Just a, a better example of those changes. You'd think that measuring a palpebral fissure would be a simple matter, uh, just holding up a ruler in front of the face. But it actually takes a fair amount of training. Where you position the ruler, where you place your eye, 
how to deal with parallax, how to not turn the ruler too much. Um, there are a number of things that can uh, change accuracy here. And if you're off by more than a millimeter, you can be off by a standard deviation. Uh, so this is actually a uh, more of a sophisticated thing to do than you might initially think. Next slide. Um, so here again, everybody with FAS has lots of funny little changes in their face, but these three are the ones that uh, make the face look like this disorder. Next slide. It turns out that we were unclear if palpebral fissures should, in normal children, be the same sizes at, all, at, 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 at the same ages. Do blacks, First Nations, Asians have comparable palpebral fissure size to whites? Also, there was concern in the past that the growth charts were, were simply not accurate and could be off by a standard deviation at any age. In response to these concerns, uh, Ab Chudley and I completed a large study of normally developing children from grade 2 to grade 10 across Canada. Um, that, though, that work is now published, in fact, in the Canadian Journal of Clinical Pharmacology in the electronic version of the FAS journal. It came out in 2010 uh, and should be easily available. What we found is that the eyes do grow until people are about 16. Boys have slightly larger eyes than girls. Blacks and South Asians are slightly larger, Caucasians and First Nations in the middle, Asians and Southeast Asians slightly smaller. But all of these differences um, among races are less than one millimeter, which is less than the ability to measure the differences with a handheld ruler. And consequently, we were able to put everyone on the same grids. The grids are different than the previous Hall grids. And what's amazing is that about 40% of normally developing children in Canada would be said to have minus two standard deviation eyeballs, according to Hall. So 40% of normally developing kids would be called small eyeballs. Um, that's not to say that, it, that fetal alcohol syndrome is not associated with short palpebral fissures. It is. But they are usually very short. And these new norms should be helpful for screening. Next slide. Now, why should alcohol predict the features that it does? Well, the eyeball itself, of course, is eye tissue. And so it's, I mean, I'm sorry, the eye is brain tissue. Um, and it's, so it's the first window that the face has into the brain. Um, but look at these embryologic slides of the little blue area, which is neural crest cells of, from the prefrontal region. This is initially brain tissue coming from neural crest. Those cells dedifferentiate, lose their neurologic capacity, and become face tissue. And as you see, as the face comes together, it winds up being the center part of the philtrum in the upper lip. This anomaly can be produced in, in monkeys and produced in rats, very specifically at the time of gastrulation, uh, back in a picture about at, the, at, a, at a. Um, and anomalies in a window of approximately the 19th day of pregnancy uh, cause this flat filtrum smooth upper lip um, situation. Did I just say that backwards? Yeah. The flat filtrum thin upper lip. Anyway, if you think about that, it means that if you don't have a flat filtrum and a thin upper lip, you won't have the full face of fetal alcohol. If you don't have the full face of fetal alcohol, you won't have the defined condition of fetal alcohol syndrome. So while alcohol is causing damage across time during gestation, in fact, fetal alcohol syndrome requires exposure in a very short period in the 19th or 20th day of pregnancy, which may explain why the syndrome is a, such a, a low frequency finding in the spectrum. Next slide. And this is just to emphasize that while there's this point in time for the lip and filtrum, the real damage to the embryo from alcohol is occurring over broad periods across much of gestation. Next slide. Very old slide on my first paper on fetal alcohol. Um, 
shortly after Smith and Jones and colleagues defined fetal alcohol syndrome, the first baby who died with the disorder came to autopsy, and I was a fellow in neuropathology at the time, and the brain came to me. It doesn't take a neuropathologist to appreciate that that bottom slide is damaged in every way a brain can be damaged. The cortex is abnormal and thin and flat. The ventricles are too large. The corpus callosum, the big band in the middle, is in fact missing. Um, white matter is deficient. Basically, this brain was universally and completely malformed. While this degree of damage is rare in fetal alcohol, Every part of the anomaly seen here has been found in one child or another. Alcohol has the capacity to pretty much damage every organizational system in the brain. Next slide. Um, this is, I don't know if you can all see this exactly, but um, the, the surface of the brain is actually here, in this case of fetal alcohol. Are you doing it? I am. And so Can you uh, point out where the true surface of the brain is? Yes. So the normal surface of the brain is that little white line, sort of in the middle of that slide. And the cortex is below the line. What's above the line is actually a malformation. Um, neurons migrate from the center of the brain in the terminal matrix to the cortex, find the area there to stay in, and stop migrating. In this severe case of FAS, they didn't stop migrating. The cells continued through the cortex onto the surface and became a surface malformation. These types of heterotopias are actually seen frequently in fetal alcohol, but they're usually small uh, and they're usually di uh, diversely placed. Most kids with FAS, of course, are not that severely malformed and they don't die. And indeed, the whole notion of doing screening to look for structural malformations of the brain as a part of the definition have not been terribly helpful. About 85% of kids who have um, brain damage related to alcohol still have normal sized brains and grossly normal shaped brains. So simple MRIs, simple CAT scans, certainly uh, ultrasounds show nothing abnormal. However, more modern visual tape techniques, such as these, uh, do show uh, abnormalities. Unfortunately, these are really not ready for clinical uses yet. Chris and I learned uh, at the meeting last week that these kinds of images are currently being used, and they're actually discovering now that there are specific patterns of lateral changes associated with the lip and filtrum anomaly and medial changes associated with the palpebral fissure anomalies, uh, further giving evidence that the face does predict to the brain. Next slide. Uh, people are now starting to use neurochemistry uh, to look for uh, changes in the brain that are not structural but chemical. And you may have heard that choline has been found to be deficient in the brains of people with fetal alcohol. The meaning of that is not completely clear but it has been consistently found over time. Next slide. So as I said, alcohol can affect every part of the brain and gives rise to then a pattern of, of um, functional abnormality, which can be um, organized this way, with brain stem causing problems with regulation of state, cerebellum at least giving rise to issues of motor skills, coordination, balance, possibly vision, the limbic system, having issues of retention, uh, the left temporal lobe, speech and language, the frontal lobes and the prefrontal lobes, executive functioning and reasoning, and then, of course, multiple other multiple locations for memory and learning and cognition. And that all leads to a final common pathway, which is a person's ability to cope in the real world is diminished, and their adaptive skills are low based on multiple patterns of anomaly above. Next slide. For those of you who like a mnemonics, this can be reorganized as alarmers, uh, misspelled, uh, I think appropriately. Um, and one can then think about all the different ways one needs to evaluate the brain in order to understand the adaptation. Uh, simply determining that somebody is not doing well in, in school, at home, in society, 
uh, is not the answer. It is only a clue. It's the place to start. Next slide. These are just some of the behaviors that, that are found in kids who have uh, FASD. You can see it's a very broad list. And at this point, we still don't know what the, the top functional diagnoses are. We just have a long list of them comprehensively. Next slide. Now, normal adaptive behavior really depends on three broad interactive functions, temperament and mood. Are you a happy, sunny person? Are you slow to warm up? Are you interested in the world around you or kind of not so interested? That alternates with your ability to have cognition and brain processing and to understand the world around you. And all of that is further mediated by your environment, broadly defined. If temperament and mood, brain cognition and processing, and, and um, environment are all reasonably normal, we call you normally adaptive without really looking at the balance between the three. Next slide. But if you have psychiatric condition, decreased IQ, learning disorder, memory problems, executive function problems, or if you have medical problems or an adverse environment, this is an important piece. Any or all of those can lead to the maladaptation that we see at the end. And indeed, people with fetal alcohol have problems at all three poles. They frequently have trouble with psychiatric conditions as well as cognitive problems. And their environments have often been very adverse. Understanding that the maladaptation in part is related to the function of the brain is critical. But understanding that it's also related to medical conditions, psychiatric conditions, and an environment is equally important. Next slide. Now this condition has been given many names in the past. This notion that diffuse brain damage has multiple sources and, and has a whole hold on brain structure and function started with terms like static encephalopathy, minimum brain damage, and dysfunction. Those conditions, however, were poorly defined poorly diagnosed and became so confusing that the condition and its definitions were eliminated in the early 1970s. It's a reality, but because we quote unquote eliminated them, no one's really been studying this uh, for a very long time. Now. Next slide. Keep going. Now, here's an important point. If Maladaptation is due to a health problem or an environmental issue. As a society, we call that a disease. And we think that our interventive goal should be treatment or cure. If the issue is temperament or mood, a psychiatric condition, if you will, societal judgment might be a disease state, but it could also be disobedience. The intervention goal, if you think it's a disease, would be treatment or cure. If you think it's disobedience, you might also think of it as a cure, but through punishment or separation as strategies. But we think that all of that is reversible. Whereas if the problem is cognition or performance, the societal judgment will be disability or disobedience. The intervention goal is acceptance or treatment, hopefully, not punishment and separation. Because folks with FASD often have abnormalities in all three of these areas, we need to separate out what part of their condition can be treated or cured and what part must be accepted and dealt with as a disability. This sorting out, actually, is the core of an FASD evaluation. It is by far and away the biggest part of what's done in an assessment. Next slide. So, Who's at risk for having FAS? And how much drinking does it really take to get us there? Next slide. This slide is actually not 
a joke, um, and it's endlessly out of date. It shows that, in fact, the more we've looked at the, the patterns that cause abnormality from alcohol, the more pathways we've discovered. This is uh, as, as complicated a picture of toxicity and ter teratogenicity as you can imagine. And it means that a medical model for intervention has not been forthcoming. We've not been able to figure out what you could drop into an alcohol bottle to prevent the alcohol from causing uh, fetal alcohol. Probably never will be able to do that. Next slide. So timing's important. Um, it seems that if fetuses are exposed to huge amounts of alcohol in the first 10 days of pregnancy prior to implantation, it may lead to an early spontaneous abortion. But otherwise, it doesn't seem that the fetus before there's a placenta and a blood connection is harmed by uh, lower levels of alcohol exposure. However, from implantation until the end of the embryologic period, uh, there is a very high risk for major malformations, including brain damage. And thereafter, while the organs are in place, growth is occurring and the brain is at risk throughout gestation. Next slide. The dose of alcohol um, has not yielded a simple dose response curve. The more people drink and the more frequently they drink it, the risk goes up. But because of all of the difficulty with actually accurately capturing how much women have been drinking and evaluating exact outcomes in different children, we've been uh, limited in our ability to produce dose response curves. Suffice it to say, it's a relative risk. No amount is absolutely dangerous. Women have consumed enormous volumes of alcohol uh, regularly and have had children who are unharmed. But no amount is absolutely safe. Studies of populations of children exposed to small amounts of alcohol do detect subtle abnormalities in the group of kids as a group effect. Um, so we've not been able to do what we've done for drunk driving, which is to put a line in the sand and say, you know, below this you're pretty safe, and above this you're less safe. Uh, it's been more difficult, unfortunately. Ironically, the single most dangerous pattern is a binge pattern. Women consuming four to six drinks at a time or more, drinking once or twice a week. If someone went to their doctor and said, doctor, I really want to have a child with FAS, how should I drink? That would be the recommendation. Perversely, that's exactly how we've taught young folks to drink over the last 20 years. Binge drinking on Friday and Saturday nights among boys and girls across the Western world has been on the increase for two decades. The highest possible risk of drinking approach. Next slide. The fetus also plays a role. Um, these are twins. In identical twins, there tends to be a similar degree of effect. For twin, fraternal twins are more likely to be variously affected uh, to the point of this pet, a couple of children, where one twin was perfectly normal, the other had almost complete fetal alcohol syndrome. So if the medical model um, has taught us an awful lot but not how to prevent FAS, then the other way to look for prevention would be through a social model. To think about who the birth mothers are and to think about how we could help women either uh, prevent pregnancy if they're drinking or stop drinking if they want to become pregnant. What's remarkable is that almost every clinic that sees children with fetal alcohol reports a very high rate of seeing foster and adoptive mothers. Birth mothers don't come into clinic. That's another problem for this field. Indeed, the reason Dave Smith and Ken Jones named fetal alcohol syndrome fetal alcohol syndrome was for, the, was for prevention. They thought that if mothers became aware of the fact that alcohol was causing harm, they would stop drinking. And yet, as these clinics opened, the birth mothers weren't there. Um, Susan Astley and I thought that we could still use uh, the children who had fetal alcohol as, an, as a, an opportunity for prevention. We wondered if we couldn't go and find the birth mothers, even though they weren't coming into clinic, 
and find out what they were like. So we had identified 160 children with fetal alcohol syndrome over a three-year period. Ten of them were living with their birth mothers. Seventy of the other mothers uh, were involved in their children's lives, and even though there was, they weren't, we're going a little too fast there, Chris. Uh, Seventy of them were still involved with their children's lives, but could be contacted. Forty were known in systems, but we could not get to talk to them because of confidentiality reasons. Forty were missing or dead. That is to say that if you think about FAS as a biomarker for a disease in the mother, when you achieve that biomarker, there's a 25% mortality associated. The 80 women who we could locate all agreed to participate. Um, they were a little reluctant to actually come in at the end of the day, and we uh, needed a social worker to help them uh, come in. Uh, we couldn't tell them what their child's diagnosis was, but we were prepared to tell them what we could about their children up to the level of confidentiality. None of them asked what was wrong with my child, but they frequently told us that they knew their child had fetal alcohol syndrome. Next slide. These women were in the expected distribution of minority and majority people. They had started life at all levels of society, but most now lived in poverty. They had a reasonable distribution of IQs, but there was a blip of low IQ scores at the bottom. Next slide. There was a nearly universal report of lifetime experiences with extreme physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. Indeed, the, the social worker who worked with these families and the nurse who did all of the interviews required therapy for secondary post-traumatic stress at the end of this uh, evaluation. Nearly all of these women had had long-standing battles with alcohol use and abuse. Next slide. So that we would expect them to have two mental health diagnoses, but in addition, next slide, most had many other severe forms of mental illness. Next slide. and multiple diagnoses in the DSM. Next slide. They were very isolated. By the time we saw them, they were living in, a, in uh, restricted environments with very few friends, very few relationships, and limited activity. About half of them had fetal alcohol themselves. Next slide. And the best access they had to services, including mental health and medical care, was when they were pregnant. So when one looks at these women, one sees, go back, when one looks at these women, one sees that they were actually in difficult straits, trying to get help, having difficulty getting help, couldn't get mental health and addictive services to work together frequently. Alcohol started to look like a self-medication in pregnancy a self-intervention. Recent studies further disclose that women of this sort grieve actively for the loss of these children and make more children again for the hope that they could do a better job the next time. Well, um, it's, uh, it's at this time where Sterling and I wanted us to recognize that women um, don't drink alone frequently and they certainly don't conceive alone. And in addressing uh, messages uh, for uh, women at risk, uh, first it was to look at a universal message that uh, included uh, the woman and the fetus, but also her partner, um, sometimes in the shadow, sometimes excluded very often forgotten. And uh, depending on the setting, um, different settings need different messages. Uh, this is an example of a universal message that was uh, distributed uh, through the British Columbia Medical Association in the 1990s. Uh, we worked a long time with the message that, you know, alcohol can hurt our babies, not their babies, but our babies. And that uh, 
that uh, that addiction and mental health concerns uh, have uh, uh, historically been uh, woefully underfunded uh, uh, and specific uh, uh, women-centered approaches uh, unavailable. Uh, even at the time we started, women did not have access, preferential access to detox. Uh, when we first called, they said, well, we don't take babies here. And we said, no, no, the, the baby hasn't been born yet. Um, uh, early programs excluded the partners, and uh, just as in uh, uh, relationship violence programs, uh, these programs are not successful. If a woman does have a partner in her life, it's important to engage uh, with them um, so that uh, uh, that they are supportive for a, a woman uh, to to make steps, uh, uh, and and they may be small steps. They may first start with harm reduction, just uh, less stress, better nutrition all the way through to uh, um, the a goal towards uh, stopping alcohol use altogether uh, uh, with the, the hope uh, uh, that uh, there will be continued support after the birth of the child and continued involvement. In British Columbia, we chose to put uh, this in the seven most frequently spoken uh, languages in the province. Uh, of note, actually, uh, French was uh, the seventh uh, most uh, uh, um, in that, and so you do need to know your community um, and where you're working, and there have been a variety of messages that have been done across Canada, uh, all of us recognizing that uh, awareness messaging uh, is, is not the only part of a prevention program. And uh, Dr. Claren, uh, I think, very eloquently uh, described how working with at-risk women, uh, women who we know are binging, uh, and right now the concern are women in their childbearing years, uh, mostly in that well, you know, sadly 15 to 25-year-old uh, age group, uh, but moving through then to uh, women who have had longer uh, standing issues around um, uh, mental health, unaddressed mental health concerns, and often relationship violence, early childhood abuse. And uh, we are uh, now involved with uh, with intergenerational effects of FAS uh, with women who themselves have a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and uh, and they need to be included in our messaging as well as uh, in uh, in programs uh, that can reach to them. And as uh, Dr. Astley and Dr. Claren found in their study, half of the women uh, that uh, had children with full fetal alcohol syndrome had uh, had evidence or, or a suggestion of, of FAS themselves. So uh, a prevention program must link uh, the, the awareness programs with programs for uh, targeting at-risk uh, individuals and then also be inclusive of individuals who may be affected with uh, the condition. Um, but then it's uh, an issue of how do you know uh, um, who's affected uh, from uh, the child uh, through to the mother uh, and know no one of us, no specialty, uh, is trained appropriately to recognize all the aspects of this condition or to recognize when a patient actually has uh, a, a, something that looks like FASD but it actually might be genetic or another uh, environmental exposure or might be acquired, uh, might be another birth defect syndrome. Uh, and uh, there's some disagreement on uh, how to codify, how to put all this together. And uh, just as Dr. Claren had said, uh, working alone uh, uh, can lead to uh, caregiver fatigue and, uh, and burnout and post-traumatic stress disorder. So uh, the message here is, is never work at all, alone. This requires a multidisciplinary approach, frankly a transdisciplinary intersectoral approach uh, linking with the multiple uh, systems and, and most important with the resources in the community where uh, uh, these uh, uh, families uh, may live. So the classic dysmorphology approach, uh, which was outlined in the Institute of Medicine, uh, uh, sort of gold standard report in the 1990s, uh, addressed the growth face and brain, uh, included other malformations if you had the alcohol-related birth defect uh, in the context of alcohol exposure uh, surrounding uh, this. Uh, that uh, uh, will not be uh, adequate uh, and easier uh, way to start to have people break down uh, uh, the team approach is to, is to use uh, uh, much of the approach that we might have learned in our, uh, in our biostatistics and epidemiology. Uh, we have to credit Dr. Claren and Dr. Astley for, for 
putting uh, the uh, FAS uh, diagnostic approach uh, or for FASD into a um, into four digits uh, and then uh, so four domains and then the four digits of severity uh, so that one uh, can look at uh, um, the domains of growth, the facial features and, and impact on the brain and in the context of a known or unknown alcohol exposure and actually code that so that growth deficiency is on a scale from no exposure or, or no growth deficiency all the way through to significant growth deficiency and Dr. Claren's early slides show that uh, even in that early group, uh, the majority did not uh, have uh, significant growth uh, deficiency but might fall more in the, the moderate or even mild range. Uh, and so you can't use that as a, as a single factor to, to screen or diagnose FAS uh, or F, an FASD. Um, the next would be the facial features uh, and, uh, and the, f the four would be if all, all three features that were identified in the facial photography approach uh, uh, would uh, code uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, significant uh, facial involvement. Uh, um, and then the example of brain dysfunction, uh, if there was uh, a physical evidence, uh, either significant impact on, on cognition, uh, well below measured uh, 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 abilities associated with the, that are associated with intellectual uh, 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 disability, uh, or or frank brain malformations. Uh, it uh, and and then uh, and then lastly, the level of certainty of uh, of alcohol exposure uh, with. Uh, with this example of 3444 uh, representing a, a full fetal alcohol syndrome uh, because of the definition that uh, um, uh, the growth deficiency uh, can be in the moderate range. But uh, uh, each, uh, each individual can be placed on this grid. It, it begins a discussion point uh, and these, uh, these aren't fixed in time. They may change over the, the development of, uh, of the individual uh, and as more is known about the brain domain or certainly more is known about the level of alcohol exposure. So the Canadian approach was to really harmonize the Institute of Medicine uh, uh, report, which was accepted as a gold standard in the 90s, um, to bring in this uh, really a, a practical approach of using the four-digit uh, uh, coding system and, uh, and then put it in a, in a language uh, that was uh, current uh, in the uh, Canadian healthcare system system and social service, uh, um, social service uh, 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 programs um, as well as uh, uh, to reflect the values uh, of our, our universally uh, funded uh, healthcare system uh, with an approach to diagnosis and the recommendations for how to access a diagnosis uh, with uh, uh, what was available uh, in your health region. Uh, this was published in the CMAJ in 2005. Uh, and as my colleague and co-author of the guidelines said, uh, these are guidelines. These aren't laws. These are guidelines. And uh, and with time, these guidelines uh, will adjust and and change. But it has made a significant difference uh, in Canada to have uh, East Coast and West Coast uh, using similar terminology and a similar approach to describing um, individuals that are assessed and. Uh, in, uh, in approaching diagnosis. Um, in, the, in the 2005 guidelines, and I, we won't belabor this, but uh, there were identified nine domains uh, that were the neurobehavioral measurements. And it is interesting now with the uh, newer research studies in neuroimaging that Dr. Claren referred to uh, that many of the things that were identified are, are indeed uh, showing correlation with the advanced uh, imaging uh, in showing that uh, we, we may, at one point become be able to be more sensitive and more specific for the behavioral phenotype or the behavioral um, uh, fingerprint uh, of, of what uh, uh, represents brain injury under fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Uh, and the alarmers that T showed earlier uh, that are included in this uh, that have to do with uh, attention and adaptive behavior and memory and executive functioning. Um, uh, are uh, incorporated uh, uh, in these uh, uh, nine domains. Um, but the growth deficiency in FAS, uh, uh, those subtle impacts on growth may occur uh, uh, in pregnancy, but uh, uh, it 
it generally growth, obvious growth deficiency is occurring in the latter parts of, of pregnancy. Um, women who stop drinking by mid gestation will not have the growth uh, deficiency in, in infants. And with our outreach and harm reduction programs, we are certainly seeing less of the growth deficiency uh, and only uh, for me personally I'm I'm seeing it only in women who are older and have had multiple pregnancies uh, and uh, other affected uh, children uh, so there is something about uh, age and uh, and number of uh, pregnancies uh, and perhaps the length of, uh, of uh, addiction and perhaps even the nutrition uh, and health of the mother that has an impact on uh, whether or not we will we will be able to to uh, even consider growth as an important uh, marker of uh, alcohol exposure in the future. Um, can we screen for growth? Uh, most children who are abs uh, uh, who are absolutely growth deficient will not have FASD. There are genetic causes. Uh, there are uh, causes associated with uh, prematurity and complications of pregnancy. Um, and uh, and lastly, most children with FASD have no individual evidence of growth deficiency, as we discussed. Uh, if we uh, if we were going to develop our screening tools uh, for the face, when only when we see the eye slits are less than two uh, at the second percentile, and the lip and filter are both thin and flat. Uh, and although that does predict the face, uh, this is too specific and sensitive for FAS. And uh, Dr. Claren very nicely went through this. Uh, discussion earlier, uh, this will lead to a large false negative rate uh, for FASD. Uh, could we screen for brain injury only? Um, uh, we can look uh, for this mysterious maladaptation that, uh, again, Dr. Claren nicely outlined that that uh, if you only consider a disease model, you will miss, but you have to consider temperament and mood as well as uh, 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 cognition and functionality. Uh, we can look uh, through the alarmers so that adaptive behavior, the uh, language, uh, attention, uh, reasoning, memory, uh, speech and language, uh, motor skills, uh, executive function, uh, but that won't be complete. If we looked for intellectual handicap alone, uh, we will be missing a, a great number because uh, as long uh, early on uh, studies have shown that the majority of kids uh, will not have intellectual uh, disability as measured on on a typical uh, uh, IQ test. Um, and so currently there is no pattern that is specific for FASD. Um, and this will lead to large false positive rates. So what do we need? Uh, can we screen for the mothers? Um, we can uh, look for women who, who drink uh, uh, excessive amounts, and uh, both Dr. Claren and I had sons who collected Mad Magazine, and uh, uh, this is a this is a, uh, uh, a shocking, as always, and 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 poor taste, as the Mad Magazine said. But but looking for women who have significant uh, uh, alcohol use disorders who are uh, out in the public, uh, drinking actively while pregnant, uh, but. Uh, uh, but there will be some rate of false positive even among those women who drink heavily but uh, either have uh, children who don't show any physical features or for yet unknown reasons uh, appear to have children uh, who are not uh, showing the brain injury profile uh, typically seen in FASD. And there will be some rate of false negative among uh, uh, women who did not drink at those high levels uh, but do have children affected by FASD. So uh, uh, you cannot uh, do this uh, by screening in one domain alone. Um, so there is no screening tool that can individually screen for alcohol uh, exposure and the adverse outcomes found in FASD, and that is why uh, a toolkit is needed. And uh, as Elaine mentioned at the beginning, uh, the National Screening Toolkit has been released. It is available online. Uh, through CAPC, through Ken, uh, it is a dynamic uh, uh, model. And uh, again, next month you will find out more about the elements of the toolkit. Uh, but uh, uh, we need to say that this toolkit ranges from being able to screen uh, the newborn through to uh, youth, young adults, uh, with uh, in including things such as uh, meconium uh, on a population 
uh, based to see if there are high rates of, uh, of uh, alcohol use so that can be detected from the beginning, about the beginning of the second trimester on through to screening kids who may come in for concerns regarding uh, their temperament and mood and their behavior uh, through a neurobehavioral screening tool uh, in, uh, in communities uh, where schools can be involved and, and more culturally appro uh, 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 appropriate settings, uh, the medicine wheel or northern circle tool uh, uh, to work uh, to identify children in their, and their, uh, as well as their mothers and provide uh, earlier diagnosis and much earlier support and intervention. The Asante probation officer tool has uh, been uh, field tested with youth and uh, may uh, also uh, be uh, tested in working with adults in correction. And lastly, uh, well validated uh, in uh, studies in large population in the United States, uh, uh, screening tools for maternal drinking uh, and uh, a, a, an excellent compilation of, uh, of the available tools uh, as developed uh, and used through the Mother Risk Program uh, for screening for at-risk women in, uh, in pregnancy. Um, so uh, we're, we're coming now into the, the last part of our, uh, of our webinar. Uh, we want to just cover uh, some issues that we talked about, uh, about how common is this. Uh, and uh, if we're looking at uh, the population of Canada and the prevalence, which is estimated to be about 1% for FASD, uh, I'll present some newer information that it actually may be higher. Uh, then uh, the prevalence of FASD uh, is uh, about, uh, about 300,000 uh, uh, in Canada. Um, if, uh, if we looked at incidents, uh, then, uh, then you're looking uh, um, at something in the order of, uh, of uh, you know, 3,000 you know, 3, if you're looking at new births each year, uh, the definition of incidents, and then you look over age groups, 3,000 across then all ages, um, we need to look at uh, capacity. And uh, uh, this will be available to you afterwards, but newer studies are now showing that for full FAS, uh, the instance is indeed uh, uh, much higher than what we, we, we thought uh, for FAS being about 1 in 500, but uh, getting closer to perhaps uh, 1%, and certainly it's about 1.5% for children in foster care. And uh, the new work uh, I've done for in-school screening, uh, these, this has been done in the Midwest of the United States as well as in South Africa and in Italy. And uh, we're looking for FASD prevalences to be as high as 5% or 1 in 20 individuals. Uh, the early studies in British Columbia where we were looking at isolated communities where, where drinking uh, was prevalent in most pregnancies, uh, then we we can and and may still see an alarming uh, uh, presence where we go from one in twenty uh, individuals to as high as perhaps uh, one in uh, one in five individuals. So uh, there's uh, the question of why should we make a diagnosis? Uh, without a diagnosis, we have no approach to prevention. Uh, the diagnosis is possible. It's necessary. Uh, it's meaningful for individuals uh, who are affected and for their family and caregivers. And the big question is, uh, will it be available? Um, uh, we need Chris, this. Chris, yes. I just wanted to emphasize this point. Um, in all of Canada right now, I don't know where you folks are listening to this, but in all of Canada, there are approximately 1,500 slots per year available to make um, diagnoses of FASD per the Canadian guidelines. So you can all see that that there is a huge capacity problem. And in order to change that, we're going to need political support from people all over um, because availability really is the rate limiting step in so many aspects of this condition. Excuse me, Chris, please. No, I think that those uh, that and that's uh, the slide here, Sterling. You just read my mind. The slide uh, about our diagnostic uh, uh, clinic availability will be the rate limiting step. And so, before you embark on screening, 
you need to uh, think about availability for, uh, for diagnosis because screening is not the same as diagnosis. Uh, I, th I think that I only wanted to, of, of the slides that will again be included to, for later viewing, is the recognition that if you're going to return, the return on investment in human capital, that early intervention, early diagnosis is most effective if done young, uh, in the preschool period, uh, and certainly still, uh, still uh, for capital investment of, of return, you know, investments one one dollar for for uh, for diagnosis and intervention is you know is saves you seventeen dollars uh, uh, in down downstream costs, uh, and this continues on through the early schooling years and is important in job training, but becomes uh, but the economic argument becomes uh, less. Uh, uh, less so as uh, as uh, we um, move uh, uh, further away. So we must uh, we we must make sure that we have uh, availability of diagnosis across the lifespan and appropriate interventions. Um, so why bother to screen for this diagnosis now? Um, and the diagnosis of brain dysfunction is due to uh, due to uh, brain injury uh, is in and of itself therapeutic. Uh, um, this shifts the collective interpretation uh, of, of this from the individual problems of that he won't do it to that he can't. Uh, and it allows for selecting uh, uh, opportunities for individuals uh, to uh, be uh, uh, to have new interventions uh, and new programs. Uh, and it is one important way to identify high-risk mothers for subsequent interventions, as uh, Dr. Claren so uh, uh, so clearly indicated from their uh, their studies uh, at the University of Washington. The downside was that uh, the risk of screening will turn uh, that we could turn a screening into diagnosis if you don't have assessments that are are available. If we don't have assessment spots, uh, there's a risk that uh, inadequate FASD evaluations will be offered. And there's a risk that certain uh, children without permanent disability could be labeled um, uh, when they don't uh, 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 actually have uh, the condition. So the conundrum uh, has been that we, uh, if we don't have evidence that FASD is really epidemic, there will never be motivation to Im increase diagnostic capacity but without adequate diagnostic capacity, there will, we will never be able to prove that FASD really is uh, uh, as endemic or epidemic uh, uh, and the concern regarding its severity. But at this point, the need appears to supersede the risk. We have time for questions and thoughts, and I'm hoping that we've found Dr. Claren back uh, uh, in the audience. Uh, uh, I can now, Hello. Sterling. And Doug, you uh, are you managing questions from the audience? Yeah, we do have a, a couple of questions that I'll pass along and just uh, give people another opportunity to type in a few questions. Um, I'll just take a quick check with with uh, Dr. Claren. Uh, Dr. Claren, can you hear us? So we could hear you earlier. I think everything is back. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'll just introduce some of the questions, and uh, and, and each of either of you can can jump in as uh, wh whichever one of you feels uh, you have the you have the, an opportunity to answer here. Um, is, the first question is was is I think it's fairly straightforward. It says if a mother is FASD or has facial features of FASD, can her child have the same facial features without having FASD? If it's truly FASD. There should be no further cases if the mother stops drinking. Now, there are other syndromes that can look like FASD, so you've always got to be careful about that. But this is a teratogen, and we're talking by and large about exposure in pregnancy. If we can get rid of exposure in pregnancy, uh, almost all the damage from this disorder goes away. Right, thanks. Uh, another question was, is there a list in each city or for all of Canada on where uh, these various clinics are that I think uh, Dr. Locke was uh, describing? Sterling, you actually have done uh, an inventory through the Canada Northwest Partners, uh, Research Partnership on, right. of diagnostic clinics, uh, and also uh, that information is available through, through uh, uh, Health Canada. Um, uh, Actually, it's not the, the publication. 
the best the best list of clinics can be acquired from our website. Um, it's the most accurate, and we we strive to get it up to date. Uh, so you can go to www.canfasd.ca, and the clinic list is is there and is updated. Ninety percent of the clinics at this point are west of the Western Ontario border. And we'll be sure to put that link uh, to the Can FASD North, uh, the, the, to Canada the, Can, North the Canada Northwest FASD Collaborative. Uh, we'll put that information on the uh, Knowledge Exchange Network as well. Uh, the next, uh, the next question was: uh, Is there an age at which a family could be reassured that a child is not affected? Great question, Chris. Do you want to answer that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, um, I a. I think that uh, what we have learned is, is that our our uh, neurobehavioral um, measures, those which are are done to look at an impact on the brain, become more sensitive as uh, as we grow, and we can look for differences. Um, there's a point at which um, we ha we have to look and and recognize that we are all unique. And uh, although the sensitivity um, increases as, as we get older and we know that our brain continues to grow and develop, and frankly, uh, even to organize uh, our executive function uh, uh, tasks well into our, uh, our 20s and, and perhaps up to 30 um, before we start to deteriorate, uh, uh, that, uh, that there may be subtle effects that at this point uh, uh, might one might attribute to uh, uh, prenatal alcohol exposure, but uh, it, uh, it generally the transition points where we find kids have difficulty are this, the early acquisition of language in the preschool years, the transition to kindergarten, the transitions uh, it, it between elementary and intermediate, so grade, grade four, uh, then middle school or you know high school, so grade seven, eight, and then staying in school, um, and then the transition to living independently. Um, sadly, it, we have a disproportionate number of children living in care, uh, and uh, for those of us who are parents, we don't uh, we recognize that uh, kids aren't ready to be fully pushed out of the nest at uh, eighteen or nineteen. And uh, I believe that we need to be looking more carefully uh, at uh, youth uh, who have been in care before they transition into adult services where, where no one currently uh, uh, or, or very few are, are looking carefully for the possibility that uh, these are, are individuals who, who, who can't uh, as opposed to that they won't uh, um, uh, fit in or uh, adapt. Uh, Sterling, uh, 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 in addition to that? Yeah, just, just one or two. I, I, all of us have brains with strengths and weakness. And alcohol, you know, can impact some of the areas of weakness. The real question for all of us, it, whatever your brain, is do you have enough strengths in your brain that you can participate fully in the world and compensate for your deficits? Um, and, and if you think about the FAS kids that way, like everybody else, some who are mildly affected are certainly going to do just fine in this world. So the answer to when can you be sure anybody's brain is completely normal? Never. But you know, usually by seven to eleven, if you're going to have some major trouble with learning or social skills, they're going to be apparent. All right. The next uh, question um, regarding children in foster care: uh, What are the percentage of FASD children? Uh, this the person asking the question understood it's 1.5 percent of children in foster care. That that's for full FAS, and that was a screening that was developed by Dr. Claren and Dr. Astley with the uh, state of Washington. And, and uh, if we recognize that FAS is the tip of the iceberg, uh, uh, and estimates of that FASD may be five, ten times greater, um, you, uh, you it is certainly. Uh, uh, 
anecdotally uh, reported uh, that uh, a significant number of, of kids who are in foster care have been removed because of maternal addiction and mental health concerns. And so that uh, the, the index uh, of concern should be raised for kids who, who are in foster care and, and sadly for kids who have had multiple, uh, multiple placements uh, and have had other uh, 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 adversity. These, these, these kids have much higher rates of, uh, of, uh, of, of, not, uh, of not being included uh, and active in participation but may have uh, had more maladaptive behaviors and uh, even uh, uh, trouble with the law. Uh, just a quick announcement, uh, Margaret Taylor, I'm assuming she's from Calgary, has uh, just written a, a, just a bit of information here. She says, via telehealth on Thursday, March 10th, the Department of Psychiatry at Alberta Children's is doing a, uh, some sort of a, a presentation via telehealth uh, by Dr. Frank McMaster on brain imaging in pediatric mental health. She says she's not sure if FAS and FASD is included or not, but information can be found at SACHN's website. That's the Southern Alberta Ch Child and Youth Health Network, S-A-C-Y-H-N.ca for more information. But uh, the next question is uh, how, and I'm not sure you can answer this specifically uh, for the nation as a whole, but how will we ensure that screening for FASD is done in a knowledgeable, respectful way that will not cause further harm to the, to the child and the child's family? I think that is a fabulous and critically important question. And it is not the intention of the screening uh, toolkit to be launched as, a, as an active uh, participatory event yet. I think there are many questions of that type that need to be very, very carefully evaluated uh, first, and they have not been as yet. And to recognize that this is a tool kit, and no one tool stands alone, um, and that there uh, are tools, and, and there may be uh, other tools that are created to add to this, but but as the World Health Organization has outlined, uh, in beginning screening, you you must have the available diagnostic and counseling services uh, to address both uh, those who are found to be true positives as well as to support those who who may have been screened and actually don't have the condition. Now we have come to the end of our hour and a half. Uh, we do still have the, the, a large, well over 100 people still on the webinar. We do have about another five or six questions left. Um, Dr. Claren and Dr. Locke, if you're willing to just stay on the line for the purposes of the recording that we're doing, would you mind staying on and just answering uh, the questions for those who are willing to are able to stay on longer as well as for the recording? I'm happy to. Certainly. So, so Doug, um, just a just a just a quick uh, so the people know these exist in the slides. So, uh, from last week's research meeting, where over 20 countries were involved, uh, we know lots more about translational translational research. Uh, the screening toolkit was presented. The SOGC guidelines for uh, women in their childbearing years, which was published in August, is there. Excellent guidelines very clear about the public health message uh, for drinking in pregnancy, that it's the, the prudent choice is to abstain, um, and that there's information about that whole controversy of low-level drinking, uh, that there's a, uh, we can't actually have evidence to talk about fetal safety or harm at, at low-level drinking, and that we shouldn't confuse the public. There's research with NeuroDevNet, uh, including FAS, autism, and cerebral palsy, uh, the work of, of uh, the Canada Northwest Research Partnership, and, uh, and then what was raised for us was this worldwide concern uh, about the epidemic or endemic binging of young women in their childbearing years. Uh, there will be another international conference in two years' time in uh, Vancouver, uh, and uh, with an interim conference uh, in April of next year, addressing the needs of uh, adults and social justice. Uh, the, uh, the basic science research uh, is exciting in the area of epigenetics, uh, that our parents nurture can affect our nature, uh, that experience can truly get under our skin. Uh, as Dr. Claren uh, uh, discussed, that the face really may be a window to the brain for those individuals who do have facial features. It is telling us about timing and types of brain injury, uh, and that uh, the neurobehavioral measures are, are being correlated with brain imaging, and that invisible injury may now be becoming more visible, 
and then this exciting area with uh, trials uh, actually occurring in the Ukraine about nutri nutritional prophylaxis and perhaps even rescue. So we know that folic acid is beneficial in preventing birth defects, but things such as choline and micro supplements, including zinc, uh, are being shown in animal studies and in early clinical data. So these are very exciting findings uh, for us uh, and for all of you to know about. Uh, and uh, in the future, uh, uh, another webinar perhaps on advances in both basic science and clinical research. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Chris. That's uh, some great information. Uh, the next question that we had on the list was, um, I'm a social worker on a postpartum community team. How does the public health nurse assess for the most appropriate supports to be offered to FAS, FAS moms for safe and healthy parenting of newborns? Mm. I work in an inner city program uh, with high-risk moms uh, and a harm reduction model. And I think you have to start with where women are at first. Do they need a safe place to live? Do they have enough food? Are they safe? What do they need? Do they need child care for their kids? Um, and uh, there are some uh, uh, excellent uh, been some excellent work that was done uh, with support from the Canadian Institute of Health Research, uh, Healthy Mothers, Communities, and Children, doing early brief intervention. Um, just as in pregnancy, many women will stop drinking just, just with early brief intervention and an expressive concern by a trusted, trusted caregiver. The same has been found for postpartum women. So it's all about relationships and trusts and working in teams that will be most important uh, in that type of setting. Yeah, I think, I think it's important to recognize that if you have a newborn who you think has fetal alcohol, the mother has labeled herself as a patient, but you're not clear exactly what her disease is. As we've discussed, all the possibilities you may have brain damage herself, she may be addicted, she may have all sorts of other issues going on. I think Chris has given you good advice about starting where, where the mother is. But again, part of the issue is, is she going to be competent to raise her child even with support? And we don't want to be too quick to remove a child, obviously. But neither do we want to be too slow. And one of the things that's been observed over and over again for the kids who have been put into foster care is they've had you know very rocky roads after they've been separated from their parents so the the whole issue of helping the mother maximize her skills and get sober and 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 get organized and monitor the child for optimum upbringing are are both your jobs and um, and it's it takes a great deal of individuation. And, it, and the, you know, the, the African proverb, it takes a community to raise a child, uh, it, it does, it, it, it very much includes uh, support uh, for parenting and for early child development uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and close uh, um, teamwork uh, among all involved. The next uh, question we had was, um, parents who are struggling with the notion that their children might be affected ask me what assessment can be done in the school system. So she's asking, what are the names of the assessments used by psychologists to indicate executive functioning difficulties, and is that the same as adaptive functioning? Um, it, first, it is not the same, um, and the challenge uh, uh, in the school system is, is that they have a limited budget and it depends on whether that the, the assessments are being funded uh, from the provincial system or uh, through the school district or even uh, from the school. Uh, access to psychologists are, are it's varied across the country and uh, and then the level of, uh, of training and, and uh, skill and use of, of more of these neuropsychological tests uh, also uh, also vary so that uh, um, uh, having a simple measure of, uh, it's not simple, but a measure of, of cognition or IQ and achievement are, the, are, are generally the, the first things that the school can provide uh, as well as really uh, I think what the teacher in the classroom sees. If you, you have a skilled teacher, they, they have picked this up and they realize this is a good kid, but this is a kid who is not understanding. Uh, so Sterling, uh, Sterling uh, uh, 
has a, a more close association uh, with the partner who is an is a, uh, education psychologist. Uh, Sterling, uh, your comments about uh, whether there's something that this that can be done in the school uh, before going uh, into a, a, a more uh, uh, multidisciplinary assessment for FAS would be appreciated here. Yeah, I, what we're dealing with, of course, is diffuse brain damage. So no one test and no one aspect of the brain ever tells you the whole story. That's why we presented those slides with all those different parts. And the adaptive test is sort of the final common pathway of um, no matter what's wrong, when you add it all up, you're going to have trouble being adaptive, getting through the day properly. Um, the battery itself is not done by any one person. It's done by psychologists, speech pathologists, and occupational therapists at a minimum. And so the schools generally aren't looking for that. They're usually, they usually have the capacity to diagnose for IQ and they often will be able to do about half the battery. So it's a good start, but it's usually not complete. It may answer the questions about why the child is having so much trouble or may not. But the real problem in Canada is what Chris said. There is a, uh, a dramatic undercapacity in most school districts um, to get the kids quickly and efficiently. All right. Um, someone has asked, uh, she's indicated that she's from the educational field, and she's asking, is it appropriate for her to join the next webinars? And I think the answer to that is yes, as many of the tools that are part of the toolkit are designed for uh, individuals and practitioners outside of PUT that are not working within the health system, such as the youth justice system, the education system, et cetera. So uh, definitely uh, many of the tools. And, and uh, the question that followed that, um, and perhaps uh, I could get uh, the presenters to comment on that as well as this next question that I'm about to ask here. Uh, if the capacity for accurate screening and diagnosis of FAS and FASD seems to only get real as children age past early childhood into school age, how are the very young children picked up for potential screening? Well, that's a real problem. Um, Early, develop, early tests of brain function are really not absolute tests of brain function. They're really tests of developmental projection. And the half of the kids with FAS who are going to have intellectual handicap, you can pick them up early. But the ones who have IQs that are more in the normal range and have more subtle trouble with memory and executive function and planning, social uh, communication, you can't test that very effectively in that range. So what we need in FAS is something that's simply not present. We need an at-risk category like we've developed for cerebral palsy. Um, and if you have the face or if you have a history of exposure or what have you, um, we ought to be able to you know, help kids in those risk groups just get good early developmental support until we can sort it out. Um, as we do with other kids with other disabilities. And I, and I think that's as good as we can do at the moment. Um, Sterling, it's Elaine. And I, I just wondered if, if we could add just a quick comment um, on the meconium screening tool, which, um, which certainly is something to be considered at this point as well. What? Sterling or, or Chris, did you want to comment well, on that? It's a, it, you know, currently, the meconium shows its, I think, its greatest uh, uh, ability to look on a population level for uh, um, whether there's a continued drinking in, in communities which may not be recognizing this. And, um, and that certainly was the case uh, where it has been uh, field tested and, and initially validated in, in, in Ontario uh, and with plans uh, uh, subs the, subsequently to, to, to validate uh, elsewhere uh, uh, this uh, in Canada this year. Um, the, the whole ethics, ethics of you know, having that information and, uh, um, and taking that you know, exposure in and of itself does not lead to um, to the knowledge uh, or, or that this child will have difficulties uh, any any different than when we have done urine screening for 
illicit drugs such as cocaine, um, that it really does need to be individualized. Uh, I'm, this question came up at the international conference, uh, and we are looking at that time when kids begin to speak and acquire language sort of 18 months and uh, through, you know, three, four. Uh, we have some promise of looking at music as a way and, and uh, how kids uh, sort of integrate and learn uh, and uh, uh, there may be there may be things yet to be found uh, uh, that would add to the toolkit that is already being used by a, a community health nurse or uh, infant development specialist using something like the ages and stages questionnaire and then as Dr. Claren mentioned adding in the adding in the knowledge of prenatal alcohol exposure wherever that has been been shared uh, uh, either by the mother or uh, uh, through uh, uh, the uh, uh, social services if the child's in care. All right, uh, one uh, we've got a few last uh, last few questions, so just uh, let me know when uh, when you've had enough, or otherwise I'll we'll keep going all day here. <laughs> um, uh, one of the questions was: Although we are using FASD on, as the umbrella term, are we still diagnosing individuals with other diagnoses such as partial FAS? ARND, et cetera, and if so, what are the diagnostic criteria or where can this person find these criteria? So yes, we are using the, the subterms as the diagnoses and they are codified reasonably well within the Canadian guidelines. Chris, it sounded like you were going to say something. Yes. No, I'm, I'm agreeing. I actually saw that they've republished the guidelines uh, and they are, um, they are available. Uh, and uh, again, I think that the approach, the Canadian approach to harmonize the Institute of Medicine language, which includes all of those subcategories with the four-digit code, uh, um, will allow us uh, to continue to uh, Learn more and uh, and be more accurate if if names change or our understanding uh, changes. Uh, uh, so um, uh, FASD is an umbrella term. I must add that in certain circumstances uh, where it's not important for the school to know that alcohol is a cause, that we talk about family adversity and stress disorders as being the umbrella for FASD, and then recognizing that alcohol. Uh, maybe a mix uh, uh, within that, but that uh, uh, that is you know, understanding this in the in the broadest context of uh, of how uh, uh, how uh, alcohol uh, may come to be used in uh, in pregnancy. Let me just add one other thing. The it's it's one thing to develop a a pattern of brain function. So you do all of the, these tests and you get a pattern of strengths and weaknesses. Um, and both are very helpful in understanding what's wrong with the person and how you can help the person. Pitching to strengths um, may be as good as working with weaknesses for many folks. What, what's not in the guidelines, what's not in any of the systems yet, is at what point you draw the line and say that this pattern of strengths and weaknesses equals disability that should get you special services in school or special help from social service departments. And the reason that hasn't been developed is that, frankly, there has not been adequate data yet for, so that people who are thoughtful and want to be helpful can reliably draw those lines. We don't have anything in FAS that's equivalent to saying an IQ of 70 is equal to disability, for example. I think that will come. But, but the labels at this point um, don't lead directly to service supports. And so it's always an individual story of taking that pattern and working with local folks to try to figure out what qualifies for service and what doesn't. I think we would both be optimistic that that will be changing over the next five years dramatically, um, but it's, it's a huge need in the clinical field at this time. All right. Um, well, here's this one should be a fairly quick question, I think. Uh, is dismaturity still an accepted construct in dealing with FASD? Hmm. What do you think, Chris? <laughs> uh, um, well, 
I, my first thought is that this issue, we, t we talk about growth retardation or growth restriction. Uh, dismaturity, uh, the term dis uh, as opposed to immaturity, means different. Uh, and so it's, if you use it in that thought, dismaturity is that it is different maturation, which um, may never be the same, but it also then leads that, that open door for the discussions and the new research in the area of, uh, of epigenetics, that it isn't just what, what has been defined by our genome, by our genes, but in a sense how our genes have been wrapped. And our genes can be wrapped in utero uh, with extra little, you know, ornaments called they can be methylated or demethylated, and they can be uh, wrapped or unwrapped after we're born, so that nurture may may alter the rates of maturation and acquisition of skills. So, so some early research, uh, again supported by NeuroDevNet and uh, and the work of Dr. Claren's uh, Canada Northwest Partnership, uh, looking at the impact of early motor training uh, on on outcomes, uh, uh, nurturing early nurturing so that dismaturity may, may, uh, may, sh may be buffered by environmental um, uh, interventions. So Sterling, have you had a chance to think about it now? <laughs> I think that's a great answer. Uh, I think in response to the, uh, one of the previous questions, uh, Lisa, who I'm assuming is from uh, Newfoundland, said a diagnosis of FASD gets the child extra services in school under neurological impairment. Uh, which I assume is a, some type of a program in, in Newfoundland. Um, here's a question here. Uh, it says, uh, I'm in northern Labrador working in remote Inuit community as a clinical counselor, wondering with extremely limited resources and no diagnostic service available, what would you recommend as the most valuable tool slash guideline to pursue for treatment, acceptance, inclusion, and education for the community? All that rolled into one tool. Well. Uh, first is I think that we need to recognize that there's inherent capacity in communities and to, f and to find that. And it's about relationships, trust, reciprocity, um, and, and where, where do you want to go with that diagnosis? Uh, we are, are in, in truth, instead of being focused on the international classification of diseases and having FAS fit in that, we need to be thinking of the World Health Organization's approach, international classification of function. And in the end, it's about activity and participation. So um, I have had the, the, the honor, the privilege to travel to the north, uh, and I've been uh, in, the, in none of it. Uh, I've I've been in the Northwest Territories and the Yukon, and uh, I am aware that that there are many communities that uh, uh, where there isn't even a there isn't a physician. There's not there's not even a, a, a nurse. Uh, all the services are flown in. Um, I believe that the 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 Northern Circle tool that's been developed out of the Medicine Wheel tool shows great promise in on the ground providing support for moms. Uh, uh, families and to children using uh, the school, uh, whether or not you need to focus on alcohol as the cause or the recognition of the, the significant adversity that the family uh, uh, it has encountered, and then moving towards uh, what to do for that child in that community, in the school, and how to support uh, their mother uh, and extended family. Uh, that's a that's the big uh, that's the big question, and I think that uh, we have to approach this in context of uh, of where people live, and uh, and uh, again the full uh, view towards uh, inclusion uh, uh, and uh, participation. I would take a slightly different approach, although I agree completely with what Chris said. Um, if you turn the question around and ask, well, how should a community take care of cancer? or HIV, or SARS, or any other serious, complex health condition, we wouldn't expect the community to do it alone. And we would expect that there would be an interaction between community needs and professional help. And this is not just a problem for the North. The professional help for this disorder is woefully inadequate, and I do not believe the solution comes from communities working on their own. 
I think oh, communities man. have to define what they need, and we have to demand more services from the provincial, territorial, and federal governments. This is simply unfair to put this degree of pressure on communities by themselves, and capacity is embarrassingly inadequate. I, 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 I do agree with you, Sterling. It was in the, this piece of, but not waiting for Superman as such as the as the documentary uh, about the Harlem uh, Kids Zone project. Uh, that uh, that the solutions, uh, the strength is in the community, and that the partnership is required to to bring in. But if if we fly in and fly out and take those resources and don't leave that in the community, we have have not uh, have, have not provided the necessary ingredients for uh, for there to for this to be sustainable. That's true too. All right, I think we have one last question, um, and even if more come in, I think we should make this the last question. Um, someone is, and I'm not sure what kind of an answer you can provide, because it seems like they may, may be you know, in need of some sort of local resources, but perhaps maybe uh, you can provide a, a national perspective on this. She says, my five-year-old daughter, adoptive daughter, recently diagnosed with partial FAS. Uh, in their community, they have no community resources, no school board support. Um, she says how, uh, she's looking for, perhaps for a, she, I think she left out a few words, but a list of names or websites or resources for better team support. She says, I've hit a brick wall in my community. Um, well, that's a, it's, a, it's a huge question, and certainly she's not alone in waking up after diagnosis and discovering that reality. So the que it's, a, it is, um, it, it's a huge and important question, for sure. Um, sometimes the answer lies in looking looking at the specific treatment recommendations that were offered by the team. So you're not looking for an overall intervention for FAS itself, but rather what did they think the main problems were that this child needed to work on, and indeed what were, the, what were her best strengths. And finding help specifically may, may be easier. Um, if that fails, then one really can start reaching out um, to some of the major websites on FAS where a linkage may be it, It's um, uh, Sterling is right about uh, reaching out. The most important thing I find uh, as a physician working with kids with special needs is having families not feel isolated and alone. Uh, no Fast is an international uh, organization. That website uh, is available, uh, um, and uh, f families can do that. Depending on the province, there there are are some provinces who have uh, special needs adoptive parents groups, um, and uh, uh, and there is a there is a, a strong network. Uh, British Columbia was known for it just being a, a parent support network, uh, birth, foster, and adoptive. Uh, all included. I, I have to note that Saskatchewan has a wonderful set of materials that they developed uh, through their FASD support network uh, that grew out of the Institute uh, for Prevention of Handicaps and uh, it's uh, that, that uh, getting online uh, now and, uh, and networking, uh, social networking uh, is extremely important uh, for families uh, during this time because uh, it, this is not a journey that you do alone. Uh, don't don't forget all of us. At least we believe in our healthcare system that everyone has access to primary health services, and primary health providers, uh, family nurse practitioner, family physician, uh, community health nurse. Uh, there should be someone uh, uh, there in the healthcare system uh, uh, who uh, who helps the family uh, connect. All right, thanks. And that, uh, that wraps up the questions. We had lots of comments coming with lots of thank yous, and you're, you're all very welcome. And thanks for hanging in uh, for, for quite a few extra minutes. And I think I speak on behalf of our presenters as well when I say it was our pleasure to, to bring this presentation to everyone. And I'm just going to hand it over to Elaine for, uh, one, uh, for some final comments. Thanks, Doug. I want, to, I want to close by thanking Sterling Claren and Christine Locke. Uh, Sterling and Christine, you've done a, just a, a stellar uh, job this afternoon and uh, and the engagement of all of our colleagues across the country I think is a um, is, is clear evidence of, uh, of, of how much people have benefited so my sincere thank you on behalf of CAFC I also want to thank Doug 
for his guidance and leadership throughout the uh, throughout the webinar, uh, and I know we all uh, extend that thank you. I wanted to um, just mention to you that our next uh, webinar uh, will be on April the 6th. We have chosen the same time of day for each one of them, so it will be April the 6th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are projecting a 90-minute uh, webinar, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll always leave that flexibility as we've done today. Um, the focus of the next webinar is really going to be getting to know the screening toolkit in its current format. Um, I also want to acknowledge a very important comment that Chris made, and that is it's a living document. It's being piloted, and it's going to continue to grow. Um, the focus of that webinar will really be on the definition of screening and the criteria that we use to select the five tools that are currently within the kit. Uh, we will drill down and focus a little bit on each of the kits and the various sectors and populations that they will target. And um, we, uh, we will again look forward to um, your participation. Uh, please share the information about the webinars and, and with your colleagues in your respective communities. Everyone is welcome. And I just want to um, add a final comment that, as Doug has mentioned, the uh, complete presentation and podcast of today's webinar will be posted on CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network. And that can be easily uh, found on CAFC's website. Um, at www.cafc.org. And on that note, I'm going to once again um, thank Sterling and Chris and ask but, Doug. But there was one uh, comment I uh, made. The, the next webinar is, is Wednesday, April 6th. I'm not sure if someone said the 7th or if it was published as the 7th, but uh, it is April, Wednesday, April 6th. Yes. Thank you, Doug. And again, my thanks to all. Have a great day now. Bye-bye now.